any article I wrote, I did a lot of journalism in that time, I could write a travel piece about, I don't know, Australia or, you know, or Bermuda or whatever, and I would somehow get into the piece, I want to write Bond, in the hope <laughs> that the estate would read it. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much for that lovely welcome and welcome to the International Edinburgh Book Festival. Today it is my great honor to be speaking with Anthony Horowitz, one of our most prolific, most versatile and best beloved of authors about his latest James Bond novel, With a Mind to Kill. I'm so happy to be here, so happy to share this with all of you. So let's have another big round of applause oh, thank for Anthony. You. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. What a, what a lovely Edinburgh welcome. And can I just also point out, in case you're wondering, there are two books on the stage, because I'm actually talking to a fellow Bond author, because Kim's book, Double or Nothing, is coming out in a week or two. Uh, so she knows more about Ian Fleming than I do, in case, you're, <laughs> in case any questions are sort of that way. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. We'll be doing a quiz later. Um, but we, we're here to kind of celebrate books, and, and we're thinking a lot about authors uh, around the world, and in particular, uh, of course, we're thinking about Salman Rushdie at the moment. And uh, we just wanted to start off with Anthony um, sharing a, a quote of Salman Rushdie to kind of bring that, that thought of him into the room. This is just a tiny extract. It's not a quote, it's not a one line, but it is only one little page. I, I, obviously, we're all so shocked and upset by what happened, and I chose a little piece to remind us that actually Salman Rushdie, as well as being our greatest living adult writer, also writes for children. So I, I took a little piece out of Haroon and the Sea of Stories because it's just so typical of the man. This, this little piece, it's so fun, the alliteration, the onomatopoeia, the energy, all with a little kernel of truth in the middle of it. It just reminds us what a great writer he is. Here it is. Just then, two separate dust clouds of scurrying passengers... Oh, no, I've got the wrong bit. <laughs> uh, no, I've got the right bit. Just then, two separate dust clouds of scurrying passengers collided in an explosion of milk churns and rope sandals, and Haroon, without meaning to, began to laugh. You're a tip-top type, boomed the fellow with the feathery hair. You see the funny side. An accident is truly a sad and cruel thing. But, 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 crash, wham, spatoosh, how it makes one giggle and hoot. Isn't that lovely? Fantastic. Salmon Rushdie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I love spatouche. That's spatouche brilliant. Spatouche is yeah. a great word. <laughs> so Anthony is one of the writers who probably doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to do just a, a brief introduction. Um, Anthony, of course, is behind television classics like ITV's Agatha Christie's Poirot, Midsummer Murders, and Foyle's War. He's the author of numerous books for children and adults, including the Diamond Brothers series, the Alex Ryder series, two Sherlock Holmes novels, three James Bond novels, and the Hawthorne series, the latest of which is just out, The Twist of a Knife. Um, and With a Mind to Kill follows on from Ian Fleming's You Only Live Twice. Um, for those of you who um, maybe don't, haven't read it or don't remember it, um, in You Only Live Twice, uh, Bond ends up by sustaining a head injury that um, leaves him with amnesia, and he's reported missing, and he resurfaces in Fleming's final novel, The Man with the Golden Gun, um, where he's, he's had amnesia, and he's, been, he's fallen into the hands of the KGB, who've, who've brainwashed him with the order to assassinate M. Um, the attempt fails, he's reprogrammed, he goes off to, to fight Scaramanga. Um, but With a Mind to Kill opens uh, just two weeks later at M's funeral, and it is said that he has been murdered by James Bond. So I'm so excited to talk with Anthony today about this. Um, as Anthony mentioned, I'm, um, I'm sort of expanding the, the James Bond universe with the first Double O novel. It's called Double or Nothing, and it's out in just under 10 days, excitingly. Um, and Anthony Horowitz is just one of my writing heroes. So this is a joy for me uh, to get to, to talk Bond. We're going to be talking a little bit. We'll do a brief reading. There'll be time at the end for questions from you and also uh, questions from the folks at home. So a big welcome to those uh, watching at home as well. Thank you for joining us. Um, this event is, is pay what you can if you're online, and we're so glad that you're here. If you do feel that you're able to give a donation, the festival really appreciates it, and it goes back into doing more fantastic events like 
this one. So welcome to those at home, welcome to those here. Um, I'm going to launch in with questions. Um, for me, I got to know Anthony's work uh, through the Alex Ryder series, which I just loved growing up, and I imagine it, it might be similar for some of you. So I wanted to uh, start off with Alex Ryder. I was curious when you were first writing the series, how did you negotiate the shadow that Bond kind of casts on the genre? Um, I didn't negotiate the shadow, I embraced it. I mean, the whole point of um, Alex Ryder was um, my desire, well, it, it started with the feeling. I mean, uh, Alex Ryder changed my life. I had written 10 children's books. They hadn't sold very well. And um, my wife was urging me to stop writing them because I was so frustrated uh, that the books weren't finding an audience. And I just had this idea, which, which I actually had when Roger Moore played James Bond for the last time um, in, uh, with a view to a kill, I think. And um, in that film, you probably know he was 57 years old. I mean, the, the gadgets in that film were concealed in his Zimmer frame. And um, <laughs> it, my, my feeling was that he was just too old to play Bond. And, was, and the light bulb moment I had was, well, wouldn't it be great if Bond was a teenager? Um, and so, at that moment, Alex Ryder was sort of born, but it was another five years before I sat down and wrote Stormbreaker in 1999. And I remember saying to my wife, you know, I know you think children's books aren't working for me, but this one is going to be different. Mm -hmm. And it was different because for two reasons. First of all, because it was, as I say, totally inspired by Bond. But at the same time, Alex Ryder, I made him as different to Bond as I could. I mean, Bond is a patriot. He is a killer, an assassin. He's a very dark character. Alex Ryder had to be every child, every teenager. And that is to say, he had to be not really a patriot. I don't think people are patriotic when they're young uh, in, in, in the way of, you know, the flag waving unnecessarily. And, and also, I wanted him, at that time, this was at the time uh, coming up to the Iraq war, and you may remember that the Secret Service at that time was considered to be very um, deceitful, but there were a lot of things being said about weapons of mass destruction and all the rest of it, which turned out not to be true. So I deliberately made the Secret Service in the books untrustworthy. And I named the head of my secret service, Alan Blunt, because I wanted to use the name of one of the greatest traitors in, se in secret intelligence, uh, Blunt, Anthony Blunt, Sir Anthony Blunt. Um, and the other thing I did was to make Alex um, reluctant. He's not like Bond, the person who volunteers you to save the country each time, whether it's on the screen or in books. He was, he was a kid who just wanted an ordinary life and was forced and manipulated into doing these adventures. And I think therein was the success of the books. Mm -hmm. The fact that he was a reluctant hero. And the books just hit a nerve at exactly the right time. I always say that you know, success in writing comes down to not just writing a great book, but to writing the great book at the right moment. You know, luck does have such a big part to play in the, in the whole process of it. And, and one other thing I will say, I'm sorry to answer your question at such length, uh, but... but um, one of the things that does concern me these days is that my publishers, Walker Books, stood by me for 10 books. 10 books that did not sell many copies. I mean, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 a year. And I think it's troublesome that young writers today have to do better than that much faster, or they won't have the opportunities that I got. And now, you know, 20 million books down the line, it's just so wonderful, copies of Alex, that is, mm. that, that, that it's just so wonderful that the publishers did back me and did stick with me. And, and, and I think that we should try not to sort of always expect young writers, new writers, to have instant success. You've got to have faith. Mm, absolutely. And it's really interesting what you were saying about um, making Alex human. I think you're right, that the, him being a reluctant hero makes him so human, there's a kind of vulnerability to that that was so relatable reading it. You know, I, you know, I felt like I could identify with that as a kid, you know, that that would be what you'd like, but, but you hope you'd be as heroic as he is. And it kind of invited you into that world. So it's interesting hearing that you sort of embraced Bond, but in some ways uh, subverted or found the differences as well. Um, and I was curious with, it seems like there's a, a kind of strand of your career where you're in dialogue with other writers. And I was thinking about your work adapting Agatha Christie and whether sort of disassembling and reassembling her plots for TV. How did that influence you when it came to write thrillers and your own plots? This, this book in particular, so brilliantly plotted. Well, thank you for that, saying that. I mean, Agatha Christie is a huge influence on me, not so much for the Bond novels as for the Hawthorne books. And I have to say, it's rather odd that I actually had the new Hawthorne, as I think you kindly said, Kim, in your introduction, came out, I think, last week, and I've been doing nothing but talking about Hawthorne for two weeks, and here I am stepping back in time to talk about, uh, what's it called? Um, <laughs> oh, yes, right, the, with a mind to kill. You see what I mean, the hole in my head's uh, with a mind to kill. Um, but um, 
Oh, what was your question again? Sorry, it was, it was to do I was wondering how adapting Oh, the influence. Christie, the influence. Yeah. Agatha Christie has a, been a huge influence on me in terms of creating, hopefully, perfect crimes and perfect crime novels, coming up with really interesting motives, clues, and endings that satisfy and never cheating an audience. She has been a big influence on me, and certainly, you know, I read all the books when I was um, between university, and I had a gap year between school and university, and actually read the book. So I read Murder in Mesopotamia in Mesopotamia, Murder on the Orient Express, on the train, Death on the Nile, I was there. So it was quite an interesting experience to actually read the books in situ. Um, but, um, but in terms of the sort of the, the pacing of books, television and film generally have been my big influence anyway, because I have this belief that when I was growing up, I, I grew up as a literary person, and, and people in this audience who are my age will understand what I mean by that, that when we were young, I remember television just being black and white, only one in the house. Uh, I remember there were one or two stations. I remember when our first color television arrived at the house, it took four people to carry it. I mean, it was sort of, you know, this monster thing. And now, of course, and, 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 special, and special effects, if a spaceship landed, it was a, it was a dish, you know, a saucer, I mean, a, a plate on a, on a fishing rod sort of thing. And now we are absolutely bombarded bombarded with incredible images. We have a film language which has speeded up storytelling. So that when I was introducing my children to Hitchcock, because I was very keen on them to read, to watch the films I loved, they couldn't understand why they were so slow. You know, why does it take the camera so long to go from you over there to you giving the answer over here. So everything has speeded up. We have a much, much more visual um, audience now, an audience that thinks in pictures, and that's what influences my books, that yeah. sense of don't just read it, see it. Mm. And I think that really comes through in With a Mind to Kill, which is a very um, cinematic book in lots of ways. And, and, and I think Fleming was a really visual writer, and in some ways the early films perhaps borrowed from his visual language, and I, and I felt that here. With a Mind to Kill, kind of, um, we meet Bond towards the end of his career, and it sort of looks back at um, the experiences that he's been through as a double O. Um, and we have this wonderful uh, kind of three-act, three-cities structure. Uh, so we visit London, Moscow, and Berlin, and in some ways that those three cities form a sort of triangle of his whole career. And I, I kind of love that looking back. So I so asked Anthony to read us a passage where we have a sort of reflective Bond uh, looking back at his career. I will say I really much, really liked the triple um, uh, uh, dividing the book into three sections. Mm -hmm. Fleming does it in Goldfinger really well. Part one, uh, coincidence. Part two, happenstance. Mm -hmm. Part three, enemy action. Mm -hmm. And that's just somehow so Fleming. And when I'm writing these books, that's all I'm doing is trying to think of things that Fleming might have done. So part one of this one is London Calling. Part two is Moscow Nights. Mm -hmm. And part three, Berlin Symphony. And the, t and the three titles do fit very well what actually happens in them. But I was thinking that was the thing I was most proud of in this book. It also opened the book because it made it easier to write because a third of a book is shorter than the whole book and it's sort of, I could just write each section and focus on that. <laughs> yeah, that's a what good What do you want uh, me to read? I'm just going to read a little bit of this. Yes. I shall do that. Thank um, you. That's I a good tip. I'm going to do that next time. I'll be able to follow, but what, did, uh, what have you chosen? Okay, I'll see, you, I'll see you when I read it. On at least three occasions, Bond had seriously considered leaving the Secret Service. He had actually written a resignation letter to Ebb, although that had been occasioned by a sense of boredom and futility, and wisely he had never sent it. He had thought he was going to be fired just before he was sent to Japan, and had welcomed it. And a long time ago, at the nursing home at Royale, there had been a conversation with René Mattis, his friend from a doozy in Bureau. After everything he'd been through with Le Chiffre, Bond couldn't see the point of going on, but Mattis had mocked him. Don't let me down and become human yourself. Those are the only words by Fleming in this book, by the way. Um, Bond had often remembered the parting words that had been thrown at him that day. He thought about them now. What had Mathis been saying with his line of work had infected him with some sort of inhuman element, which meant he would never be satisfied by ordinary life, but that instead he would have to spend the rest of his days racing around the planet, chasing monsters, until the inevitable bullet finally rewarded him with its own definition of peace. It was a depressing thought made worse by his time in Moscow and Leningrad. Everything he had seen, even Katya with her lost opportunities, had brought home to him the impossibility of the task he had set himself. Evil in this country wasn't just a group of men talking in a room, Smirsh or Stalnya Ruka. It wasn't one madman hanging out in Crab Key or another planning to steal all the gold from Fort Knox. It was a huge machine, a sickness that had corroded itself into the souls of a hundred million people. And at the end of the day, they were the only ones who would ever be able to rid themselves of it. 
Bond still had complete faith in M, in the secret service, and in the rightness of what they were doing. But lying there in the dacha, watching the light making its way in through the double height windows, he found himself once again questioning his part in it all. The criminals and conspirators he'd been fighting against all his life were becoming superannuated as time moved on, and another decade, younger and brasher than any of it had gone before, imposed itself. Things had seemed so much simpler in the years immediately following the war, and secret agents, the men and women supposedly on the side of good, were becoming more ambiguous. Bond might have a license to kill, but that wasn't the same as an absolute right. Was this the time to get out once and for all? Could he imagine climbing out of bed in the morning without a fresh cut running halfway down his arm and a bullet wound still throbbing in his stomach? There had to be a life where he could walk down a street without wondering if he had placed himself in a sniper's sights. Surely he could find a job that would pay him enough to support his admittedly extravagant lifestyle and which wouldn't bore him to death. Perhaps that was what it came down to, what he called acidi, that sense of living on the edge of a world that was forever out of his reach. Bond needed death, or the threat of death, as a constant companion. For him, it was the only way to live. Well, I quite like that. that I, yeah, I, I haven't read that for a bit, thank you. No. Um, It's a lovely, thank you for choosing it. It's a great set to choose. It really does go to the heart of what this book is all about, that sort of sense of late Bond. It's interesting that Fleming himself, as the books go on, becomes ever more, what's the word for it? First of all, he's experimenting with the form and the shape of the books because he, um, you know, I think he gets bored, frankly, with just writing thrillers. So you get books like The Spy Who Loved Me, his biggest failure, actually, his biggest disaster, uh, which is written from the point of view of the woman at the center of the story. Um, and, and, and Bond in the later books does become a little bit introspective and a little bit, and that's when this book was, went out, there were people who thought that it was a little bit straying into that dark area, but it's because I'm following in, in Fleming's footsteps, um, there was no choice for it. That is how Bond is. Can I say one other thing? Say that little sentence you. here, which includes the words, the inhuman element, that was the title I wanted to give the book. It was going to be called The Inhuman Element, which is actually the title that Fleming thought up mm. originally for, I think, Moonraker. Yes. Um, and, um, and the publishers wouldn't let me. They said oh. no, one, no one would get it. Uh, <laughs> a little Graham Greene reference. Well, that, uh, one of the reasons I think this is my, my favorite of your trilogy is because we have this, this quite melancholy, reflective Bond, and those are some of my favorite passages of Fleming where we have Bond kind of looking back at his career, and, and you've sort of written Bond at three points of his career now, kind of origins, midway, um, and, and sort of t towards the end, and I think it does recall those moments in, in Fleming um, where we meet, a, you know, like in The Spy He Loved Me, he's, he's a little bit older, he's a little bit kind of battered around the edges, and I was wondering if there was a, 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 what it was like for you in the writing to get into that headspace for Bond compared to the last two books. Oh, there's so much to unpick in that question. I mean, first of all, I've always believed, and I'm different to the other writers, um, Sebastian Falks and Jeffrey Deeve and William Boyd, they all set their books in the modern world, as indeed Kim has with her new book, uh, set in the present day. But for me, the actual timing of the books, in 1952 is the first one, through to about the end of the 60s, no, 66, uh, that's the period of Bond. To me, the timeline is very important, that you've got to stay within that world, because I am, unlike Kim, I'm not writing an original book, I'm writing a continuation novel, and Therefore, it's got to be inside the sort of top Bond world. And it's, I think it's really interesting to watch the development of the character through the books. Um, and, and you're right, um, the second book I wrote, Forever and a Day, goes right back to the beginning to a brash new Bond. Um, and the second one, which uh, was um, Trigger Mortis, was set in the middle. And so it was, an, it was necessary for me to get to the end. But in a funny way, it's a difficult game to play because if you humanize Bond too much, you actually lose, I think, what makes him such a great character. Kingsley Amis, in his book, The Bond Dossier, talks about him being a Baronesque figure, the Dark Knight. Sort of, I like to think of him almost as Clint Eastwood in The, Ma the Man With No Name. He comes in, he, he, uh, there's problems, the world is going to be destroyed, he sorts it out, and then he leaves usually on his own. I mean, the, 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 the relationships with the girls don't last beyond Not four or five long. pages no. after the book <laughs> is finished, I think. So, so I like the fact that he is slightly the inhuman element in Bond. Mm -hmm. He's not somebody who you would have for dinner. He's not somebody you would go to the theater with. He never goes to the theater or to the cinema. He never listens to much music. I think he likes Piaf in one of the, uh, yeah. uh, uh, has a connection with him. But, but and apart hates from the Beatles, that, and that's what? about it. Hates the Beatles, and that's yeah, about that's it. Yeah, that's of course. Yeah. I mean, so he's, 
you know, he, he isn't somebody who is exactly fully rounded as a human being, but he just does the job. I mean, he has that ice cold quality. And I think that's why we like him. And instantly, I think it's one of the reasons why Daniel Craig was so good in the part, those ice cold eyes, that sense of, of danger that was in the character. When I was writing these books, I always heard Sean Connery, but I saw Daniel Craig. Mm, mm. That's a beautiful combination. I think we can all agree. <laughs> uh, so w with sort of getting into that, um, I think you're right that there's kind of those two sides to Bond. In some ways, he's a, a blank that we can all project onto. Um, and I think Ian Fleming you, you sort of chose that name of James Bond, you know, quite deliberately because it's quite an anonymous name that we can sort of project ourselves onto. Um, but on the other hand, he's a very particular character and he has this... Um, yeah, he's, he maybe wouldn't be that fun a companion. He has this kind of inner despair. And we see him in this novel, not only is, is he changing, and is he kind of at the end of Fleming's arc in a way, but the society around him is changing. And I was really curious about how you write about the, the sort of late 60s. We have the kind of um, the era of, of real politic. We have uh, sort of post-war modernism in London after the Blitz. And I, I really loved your description of kind of these new buildings of, of glass and steel rising out of the sort of rubble. Um, and I was wondering, what was that like for you in the writing, putting Bond in an era where he's maybe not in such command? Well, Fleming, of course, hated the work of an architect called Goldfinger. Goldfinger, yes. Uh, <laughs> who had actually designed one of the houses he himself lived in, I think. Yes. Uh, or, or his wife. And, and, and it is interesting. The book is set in 1966, which is the year that Jean Le Carré came out with The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. And if you're very observant, you'll notice a few Le Carré Easter eggs hidden inside the book, because a year later, Fleming is himself going to die, and, and that's over. And I think that it's really interesting that we've moved from... Bond is essentially connected to the, to the war, to the Second World War, and to special operations in executive, which I wrote about a lot in Foyle's War, and which I've always had a fascination with. And so much of what's in Bond begins in that world. And of course, Fleming himself, working for Admiral John Godfrey, was very much connected to all that, coming up with sort of... You may have seen the film that was out quite recently. Uh, was it, what was it called? Operation Mincemeat? Oh, yes, yeah. Um, which, which has Fleming as a character in the background there. Um, so all that sort of the patriotism, the belief in that the war was worth fighting and the sense that, that Britain is a country that can still punch you out of its way, that it has seen off the Nazi menace and all that stuff, you know, Churchill at his best, that I think is absolutely ingrained in all the Fleming novels. Mm -hmm. But when you get to the 60s, it is beginning to fade away, as you quite rightly say. And I think that it's, you know, if Fleming had not so tragically died of, of, of a heart attack um, in 66, it's interesting to see if he could have even have continued with the mm. character. I think it had run its full course anyway. As I say, Fleming was getting a little bit bored with the formula um, and, and was toying with it. And The Man with the Golden Gun, which this book follows, is not his best work by a long way. It's quite, it's quite a difficult read. I don't know if you agree with that, Kim, but it's some of the action feels a little bit laboured. There aren't any... Scaramanga with his third nipple is quite fun, but there's not a lot in there. But for me, that book does have a wonderful opening. If you ever get a chance to read the first four chapters of that book in which Bond is sent to kill M, I, even as a boy, I always loved those chapters and always thought, wow, what would have happened if it had succeeded? And that sort of his world of getting back into Secret Service, yeah. etc. It's a fantastic good read and one of the characters just mentioned in passing in those chapters is a character called Colonel Boris and quite apart from the fact that we all know villainous Boris is um, <laughs> um, it just struck me as a perfect character to, um, to, to latch onto and to make my villain for that book. Absolutely and I, I think you're right Man with the Golden Gun it's, it's a kind of novella length um, for those who haven't read it and in some ways everything about it is a little bit reduced the villain isn't um, sort of, he hasn't got a plan to like, you know, bust into Fort Knox or anything like that. He's kind of a smaller scale. Well, I can understand that because I'd done two big plots. Trigger Mortis is about trying to sabotage the American space race and has a huge explosion and it's going to bring down a skyscraper in New York. And the other one, uh, Forever in a Day, is flooding the market in America with heroin to, to undermine American youth. It's basically a revenge story, but it's still bigger than life. And I think we all loved the Bond books, the original Bond books, for these wonderful villains. You know, I always said that the two hardest things to create in a Bond novel were, well, the three hardest, actually. The title is the most hardest. 
you just don't know how hard it is to write a James Bond title. You start with good and bad, tomorrow, yesterday, live, die, <laughs> and you sort of throw them all together and hope you can find a yeah. new formulation for them. Yeah. The second hardest thing is to come up with the Bond, what used to be called the Bond girl, but even that phrase now is, would be considered pejorative, and so I try not to use it, the love interest. It's fine, it's, quite, it's the companion, whatever. <laughs> and the third thing, of course, is to come up with these larger-than-life villains. You know, how can you beat Dr. No, Goldfinger, Rosa Klebb, Drax even, these are such, he was a brilliant writer. I think that people underestimate how good a writer Fleming was. I know the films have been so largely responsible for the continuation of Bond as a world famous character, but the books are, you mentioned the atmosphere in the books. That's what I call acidy, that's another Fleming word. That sense of being detached from life and looking at it from the sidelines and knowing that for one reason or another you can never actually be part of it. You know, he's a brilliant, he's a brilliant writer of atmosphere. He's also one of the greatest action writers. Action is not easy to write, but he does it with a, an, ext an extraordinary agility. And in a, in a, if you look at the bobsleigh race in uh, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, it is breathtaking. I mean, and the, what happens is, is the, the sentences get shorter and shorter, and then and you jump inside Bond's head and then back out again. I mean, he is a cinematic writer. There are 15 cameras pointing at the action, and he jumps from one to the other to the other, and just brings it all together in these extraordinary set pieces. Absolutely. Um, I just couldn't agree more. And I feel like if, if you haven't read the books, I imagine you're here and you have, but if you haven't, I always say to people that it, it feels funny to say Fleming is underrated because he creates one of the most iconic characters of all time, but I think he is a kind of underrated prose stylist. And I'd, I'd say the fourth hardest thing about writing a Bond novel is the, is the opening line. You know, he's, he's so good at atmosphere, as you were saying, and something like the opening line of Casino Royale, the, the scent and smoke and sweat of a casino and nauseating at three in the morning. Um, when I was first trying to write thrillers, I wrote that sentence out, thought, yeah, that's really good. And then I got a a uh, blank piece of paper and put it next to it and said to myself, okay, now try and do your own. And I just stared at this blank piece of paper for an hour, gave up. Um, but, he, but he did write that three times. Like yes. The opening of he Casino Royale, you can find it quite easily even on the net. The three different openings for it are really interesting. And you can see him actually crafting how he's going to write these Bond novels, yeah. which he wrote very, very quickly. I think but he wrote Casino Royale in three, three months. months. Yeah, three months. Um, uh, and only writing in the mornings mm. as well. So, I mean, it's an extraordinarily precise piece of work. My favorite sentence, and I think the one that I closest I got to trying to catch Ian Fleming's style over three novels, and this is the only one I boast about, the only sentence, rain rushed into London like an angry bride. And it's, I thought, wow, yeah, Fleming might have written that. It's completely meaningless. It makes no sense at all, <laughs> but it sort of sounds good. It uh, sounds fantastic. <laughs> and so in that um, kind of creating, you're not writing in Fleming's voice, you're writing in, in your voice, but there's a kind of shared DNA with Fleming's style. Well, I, I think I'm writing in his voice. I'm trying, so trying to. to occupy you that. can't. You can't write in his voice because mm. his voice is so peculiar mm. and so idiosyncratic and so clever. But I'm trying as best I can, mm. certainly to stay within his world, not to tear the envelope and yeah. and not to allow modern sensibilities to make me feel nervous of what's in the books. Mm. Uh, so so uh, although I do address them, I don't fear them. Yeah. Uh, I'm because I'm protected. This is 19. 55, 60, whatever, it's, it's yeah. not now. Yeah, and the, the, I felt like the book was very sort of research-driven. All, all three of the books, to me, have felt very research-driven. I loved all the details about the sort of era, something like the IBM machines, or um, there's an amazing chase sequence on the Thames and how you kind of deal with the policing unit for the Thames and all those things. What, what role for you does research play in the creative process? Well, research is sort of, uh, when I'm writing an Alex Ryder book, I sort of get very twitchy about writing the research, but doing the research, because it means I'm not writing. And I've got all these ideas, and what I want to be doing is writing chases and explosions and, and escapes and all that sort of stuff. And I don't really want to be sitting on the net or talking to people or whatever it is. Uh, so research can be irritating. The worst is when I'm writing a Bond novel, because I, I get into a chapter and I'm very excited about it, and I'm writing away, writing away. Then after about four lines, Bond has to have a drink, or he has to put on a, a pair of clothes, you know, a pair of trousers or something, and therefore I have to stop, and I have to go on the net, I have to search what trousers was somebody wearing in 1966, <laughs> but worse than that, what trousers would Bond have approved of in 1966, because of course, Fleming, although he's not a snob with people, is a huge snob with objects, so endlessly I'm stopping and starting and stopping and starting, which sort of disturbs the flow of the writing, because when I write, I'm immersed in the book, I'm completely there, 
there and, and writing a fight, you know, that's the pleasure of it for me. But then against that, you know, you, you start researching stuff and you look up things. And like, for example, trying to work out how um, the bad guys, the Russians, might have found out about what the MI6 were planning or the secret intelligence were planning, I came upon somewhere, I forget even how, this extraordinary true story about IBM typewriters, mm. which actually did happen. It happened instantly three years after the book finishes, which is slightly a cheat, but then that didn't stop Fleming. Fleming uses research very, very cleverly. I mean, he uses it for authority, but often what he's talking is complete nonsense. I've, I'll give you a good example from Russia with Love. He describes down to the color of the radiators, the offices of Smirsh, Smiryach Spionim, the um, secret anti-spy organization set up by, I think, Stalin. But he doesn't mention, somebody later on went to, to the office to look at the offices of Smirsh and went to the exact address in the books. They found a flower shop. It wasn't there. <laughs> um, and he'd made it all up as far as I can see. Yeah. Plus, when From Russia With Love is written, Smirsch had been out of business for at least five years. I mean, they'd, they'd closed down. But it didn't stop him having that wonderful voice of authority. And that's what research does for you. It gives you the sense that you do know what you're talking about, even when occasionally you don't. Mm, absolutely. And I think, um, so From Russia With Love was the first Bond novel I read when I was about um, 12 or 13. I said to my mom, I, I, I think I'd like to try writing a spy book, but I don't know how. Um, and uh, really, that was because of loving Alex Ryder so much. Um, and my mom said, well, you should read, read some more, which is good advice for a writer. So I went and I found a second-hand copy of From Russia With Love, and I loved that bit in the beginning, the author's note, where Fleming says, not that it particularly matters, but Smirsch is a real organization, and this is their address. And I remember being so excited, like, oh my god, it's just their address written down. It didn't matter, it was like decades later, and they'd already closed by that point. But I think you're completely right. It gives you that sense of kind of reality and grounding, and that's something that I think in this book, um, in With a Mind to Kill, makes the villain so scary because you feel like there's a reality to that. Colonel, Colonel Boris is a brainwasher, and it was quite, that was one of the challenges of the book, the brainwashing back in the 60s when Ian Fleming wrote The Man with the Golden Gun, it was considered to be a very, very serious and dangerous science. Mm. And the, uh, there had been many books written about it, and um, the Americans had spent an absolute fortune uh, uh, investigating ways to create a truth drug um, to, to, to get truth out of their enemy, and also giving their own soldiers training in case they were captured by the Koreans in the Korean War and brainwashed. Um, and then, of course, there was the film, The Manchurian Candidate, which is absolutely wonderful, probably the greatest film about brainwashing ever. In the 21st century, I think we probably look on brainwashing as being dodgy, to say the least. I mean, you know, I don't think we believe in it anymore. And it's sort of, it's the Avengers, if you remember that TV program, are sort of done for brainwashing. Uh, so making it realistic in the book required a lot of work and a lot of research, plus one really nasty chapter where I sort of demonstrate to the reader that this is what it can do. But that, to me, was, that, was a, that was a problem. It was inbuilt that it had to happen because Fleming had put it there. But again, because the book is set in the 60s, if the characters believe in it, yeah. then that's enough. Absolutely, and we're in that sort of, the Ipcris file came to mind as well. Of course, the Ipcris file is another one. The level of fear around it. Um, and we see, what I loved about how you did it was you, you kind of anchor it to Bond's trauma and what he's been through so far in his career. Um, and it kind of makes you think about, you know, what would that be like? What, what would the sort of fragility of his mind be at this point, given everything he's been through but, and how they can exploit that? But talking, you were talking earlier about research. And one of the books I read, which is credited in the back, is a book called Brainwash. I'm afraid I'm going to forget the name of the author now, but it was an, a brilliant book. And I read it cover to cover. And, you know, you read the whole book, 300, 400 pages, to get just maybe a few words that will go into the book. But three of those words were something called the magic room. Uh, the author had put that into his, the author of the, the, the non-fiction book on brainwashing. The magic room was a sort of a room that was completely disorienting, where everything was at a different angle and, 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 and nothing made any sense. And as soon as I saw those three words, I thought, wow. If Fleming had read those words, he would have put a chapter called The Magic Room, which yes. is in that book. Yes. That's exactly what Fleming would have done. Yeah, his chapter titles are so good as well. His That's chapter titles are great. You know, the funny thing is, my favorite chapter titles are puns. Mm. Uh, Trigger Mortis was a, a title that divided people because people either love puns or hate puns. Mm. But, um, but, but, uh, but Fleming certainly loved them, which gave me an excuse to go for that. Uh, and my two favorite, Goldfinger has got 
crime de la crime, which is like lovely. Yeah. And um, there was a famous ad in the day that books were written, say it with, say it with flowers, was the Interflora slogan mm. when he wrote You Only Live Twice, and he put in slay it with flowers, <laughs> like as well. Yeah, my favorite of his um, puns is when um, Felix Leiter uh, I'm hesitating, like this is a spoiler, so it's, it's not a spoiler. When Felix Leiter gets eaten by sharks in the books um, and his body is brought to Bond um, and it's left with a little note that says, um, he disagreed just, with he, something that ate him, <laughs> which I just <laughs> love so much. Yeah, um, it's, a great, it's a great line. Yeah, and so with your other books, um, you were sort of drawing on some original Fleming material um, and in this one we don't have that, but we do have, a, a, I thought, a kind of reference to thrilling cities and, and Fleming's writing about Berlin. I, I borrow from Fleming wherever I can. Mm. He did write a very good book. Well, it's not a book, it's a series of articles. He was a travel journalist for a time and he then assembled them all in a book called Thrilling Cities, which gives you a very, very good way of discovering what these cities were like. The book is set in three cities, as we began by saying, so it gave a way to discover what the cities were like back then in the 60s, including what hotels Fleming rated and that sort of thing. Mm. So, so I did use that book. And there are lots of other things that I borrowed from Fleming, which I popped in there. Characters turn up, the Scorpion out of Dr. No makes an appearance. Um, mm. And that doing that just gave me a smile because, you know, the books are, the books are my... I, I should tell you that Fleming sort of saved my life in a way. I mean, when I was a young boy in a really vile prep school back in the 60s, the books provided me with everything I didn't have, which is to say adventure, sunshine, decent food, and, and women, actually. It was an all-boys school. Uh, so reading the books was like entering into a whole different world. Yeah. And this was the beginning of, you know, my, my develop, I, was, I knew I'd be a writer by the time I was 10, but, mm. but it was Fleming and, and, and Hergé and Sherlock Holmes mm. were the three huge influences on my life. And um, the films, once a year, I still remember those days. Uh, you know, I hope I'm talking to some people my own age in this audience, but the days when you couldn't actually book a seat on a, to a cinema on a computer but had to go and stand in the rain, <laughs> and, and, and where it didn't open in, you know, 5,000 cinemas around the world in one go, it went, opened in one. And I still remember every single Bond film for the weather. Live and Let Die was the most appalling rainstorm, but <laughs> there I was, waiting, you know, waiting to get into the afternoon premiere on the second day yeah. of the, oh, of the screening. And this is sort of the, these were the sort of the stepping stones of my life. It was sort of a, a river of, sort of, I would say a river of misery, but that's sort of a little overstating it, but a river <laughs> of a, a slightly unsatisfactory childhood and adolescence, mm. you know, just punctured and kept dry yeah. by, by these wonderful books yeah. and films. And I think that's, what, that's the sort of gift of literature and those stories that are so important to us when we're young. They give us that sense of escape and adventure and they invite us into their worlds. And, and, and you've done that with these three Bond novels and this is potentially your last Bond novel. I was wondering <sighs> what you've enjoyed most about writing Bond. Well, they say never say never. I remember I told everybody that there would be no more Alex Ryder books and that, you know, <laughs> goodbye to that and thank you everyone. That was five books ago. Mm -hmm. um, so um, <laughs> um, I, I think, I think this is my last bomb because I sort of begin to understand, you know, I think I've done my job and it's mm. time to hand on the baton. And I, 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 well, your question was how do I feel about that, about leaving it? I do feel sad. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's been a wonderful privilege and a joy and a pleasure to do this. And, and I was so scared of the Fleming estate. I remember going to the first meeting wearing a suit, absolutely convinced they were going to be like smush, you know, all <laughs> around the table. But they were all in jeans and T-shirts yeah. and completely relaxed. I felt completely idiotic. But, but that said, I was, you know, it, it was a big deal for me. Yeah. I, I really wanted to write Bond. I mean, that was, that was sort of an ambition of mine. But mm. when, when they hired Sebastian Fulks to do Devil May Care, you know, it was why not me? And I began to write any article I wrote. I did a lot of journalism at that time. I could write a travel piece about, I don't know, Australia or, you know, or Bermuda or whatever, and I would somehow get into the piece, I want to write Bond, in the hope <laughs> that the estate would read it. So then they got, um, then they got uh, Jeffrey Deeve, and then it was William Boyd. And I was getting more, no, it's me, it's going to be me. <laughs> Finally, finally the phone rang and, um, you know, yeah. Corinne Turner called me eventually, the, the, who runs the estate, and, and that felt to me like it was sort of what I was born to do. I know it's wrong to say that, but it, was, oh, it, was, it mattered. Yeah. But I'm glad it's over now because, you know, it is time to move on. And, and the world of Bond is so rarefied and peculiar and, and such that it's, you know, you're welcome to it. You're, you, I, I, I'll, <laughs> I'll sit back and see what happens. <laughs> oh, so, you, while, as we mentioned earlier, while this has been coming out and you've in some ways been saying goodbye to this series, Series, um, you've had another Hawthorne book come out. Um, so I'd, I'd love just for my last question before I hand over to the audience just to hear a little bit more about that book. 
Oh, well, I don't know if anybody in the audience knows about um, Hawthorne, the Hawthorne series, of which there are now four. The Twist of a Knife was published about a, a week or two ago. My publishers asked me to write a, a, a long-running series of detective stories. I've been doing murder all my life. I mean, I, I've often joked that I've probably com committed more murders than anybody will ever meet. And, <laughs> you know, Foyle's War and Agatha Christie's Poirot and all the books I've written, one sort or another. Um, I, I, I know a lot about murder. and. Um, I, I thought to myself, what could I do if it had never been done before? Which is how I often start when I'm writing a book, is to try and think up something that hasn't been done. So I thought, who's the detective going to be? Could he be a man or a woman or, um, or, or gender fluid or English, or foreign, um, you know, tall, short, fat, thin, um, alive or dead? I mean, how about a ghost detective, a vampire detective, a robot detective, a cat detective? <laughs> All these have been done. These all exist in print. It has every detective you can imagine, a detective in a wheelchair, been done. So then I began to think about the relationship between the detective and the sidekick. And I had this thought that supposing, instead of being the author of the book, I was inside the book as the sidekick. So, so I had this idea of a detective who hires, who wants to make, earn more money in his career, and so hires a writer to write books about him and hires me, the real me, and interrupts my work on Foyle's War and the other things to write a series of books about him. And that was, so instead of being the cleverest person, mm. the guy on the hill who sees everything, who knows who the killer is before the book has even begun, you know, reached the first page, I would be the most stupid person in the book. <laughs> I would be one step, five steps behind the detective. And then I created a detective who wasn't even very nice to me. Uh, he he's, he's has a very unpleasant attitudes to life. He can be very difficult and obstreperous. And he calls me Tony, which I particularly uh, find offensive. And, um, <laughs> and, and somehow, my publisher was nervous that this wouldn't work, that it would become an ego trip, that it would become all these, you know, that it, that it might become blowing my own trumpet, etc. But somehow it seems to have worked. And by book four now, in which a play of mine is, is very, very badly reviewed by a critic called Harriet Throsby. And the very next day, she is found dead, with a, uh, stabbed in the heart, with a dagger that happens to belong to me with my fingerprints on it, and only Hawthorne can save me. Uh, and that's book number four in what I hope will be a series of 12. Fantastic. So same number, <laughs> the same number as uh, Ian Fleming's Bond yes, novels, actually, yes. as it happens. But um, that, that's the sort of figure I have in mind. Fantastic. And the last one will have a villain with three nipples, just to kind of round things off. Um, yeah, but that would be an interesting clue. The yeah. villain has, you know, it's a different world. It's not just a peculiarity. It's got to have a reference. It's got yes, to be, yes. Um, yes, he fell, falls into the sand and leaves three tiny imprints. <laughs> yeah. And Hawthorne notices. Uh, Fantastic. Uh, well, this has been such a joy for me to get to quiz Anthony, and now it's over to you folks for your questions. So we're going to bring the house lights up, and I'm going to ask you to put your hand up if you have a question. And um, a lovely um, person in green is going to come to you with a mic. And 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 that, that lady there in the blue was very um, fast with her hand And I think up, we'll row. just say if you can keep your hands up if you have a question, and we will we'll get to you. Um, Thank so you. over to here for our first question. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks for coming today, and um, I wanted to ask you, you said that you're very heavily influenced by cinema and television, and I wondered if there was going to be a relationship between your Bond books and a possible cinematic adaptation, or is it because they're set very much within the period of Bond that that might not be possible with well, locally? First of all, I've, I have to be honest and say I'm not quite sure how there's going, ever going to be another Bond movie after the last one. Uh, you may remember that Bond was not very well at the end of that particular film, <laughs> to say the least. I mean, blowing him up was one thing, but poisoning him first, really? Um, uh, so, so I don't know what the future of Bond is going to be, but the truth is, is that it will never happen. Well, it doesn't matter. It would never happen. Because Ian Fleming made a decision which his family might have come to regret, which is that he sold the underlying rights to the character in perpetuity to Eon Productions, run by, uh, now run by Barbara Rip Broccoli and Michael Wilson. And they make their own films from their own stories. And uh, Kim and myself are on the other side of the table with the estate. We are part of the literary bond. And there is no bridge between them. In fact, in all the films that have been done by Eon, they've only so far made one reference to a continuation novel. And that was a very, very brief scene that echoed Colonel Sun, in my view, incidentally, the best of all the continuation novels, including my own, uh, by Kingsley Amis, writing under the name of Robert Markham. The torture scene from that appeared in Spectre. Mm. But apart from that, um, there's been no uh, connection at all. It won't happen. So I, did, I sort of knew that when I went into this, so I, I don't mind. Kim's incidentally could be made, but, but that's because Bond is not I can say that, can't I? Because yes. Bond is not a character in the book. He's, he's very much present, but he's not there. Mm. Uh, so they can do yours, they can't do mine. Mm. 
Uh, we, have, we have questions online as well from the folks at home, so I'll, I'll do one online question and then come back to you. Um, but this question kind of follows on nicely from that. Um, Julie would like to know, have you been approached to film the Hawthorne and Horowitz novels, and how would you feel about an acting career? Would you play yourself? <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so the question I'm always asked is, if they do do Hawthorne and Horowitz, who will play me? And I, my, my stock answer is, we have to see if George Clooney is available. Um, <laughs> uh, but... Um, Actually, I'll tell you who would be a wonderful me is Rory Kinnear. Rory does the audio books, and it's, he does them wonderfully, and it's always so weird hearing me as a character spoken by Rory, because he's, he's so much more, actually, so much more interesting than me. Uh, but um, but uh, we, offer, we've, we filmed Magpie Murders, and we're hopefully filming Moonflower Murders, my other set of detective stories, and I suspect Hawthorne will get made eventually, and I look forward to it. And, and as to who plays me, I don't know. I, I won't have a say in it. I'll keep my distance. I think I'm immersed in it. The question I'll have to ask is, these are very meta, these books, is might I appear mm. as a sort of an extra in the background Oh, you'd have somewhere. to do a yeah, cameo. Yeah. It might be fun. Yeah. I'm, in, I'm in Magpie Murders, episode three. If you blink and you'll miss me, but I'm there. Oh, fantastic. Uh, um, okay, who to next? We've got a question over here, I think. There's a lady with her hand up in the sort of mid... Uh, does she have a mic? Or are we over here somewhere? Just, just call it out. We don't need to wait. You for go a for it, sir. Hey, I just wanted to ask about. I've read the Ark Strider books since I was six, and they've really sort of influenced my childhood, and I've really enjoyed them. I just wanted to know if you thought Alex Strider met James Bond in a book or in a TV show, what the conversation would be between them? Ooh, good question. <sighs> That's a really, really tough question. Um, I think, what would they have to say to each other? You, can you answer that? You know Alex Ryder as well as I think. I think it would be quite laconic. There might be some manly grunting. But, so, but the point is, Alex Ryder is so different to Bond. I mean, he really has nothing in common with Bond. And so I would never engineer their meeting. I mean, they're, they're, they're from different planets. My, that question has done my head in, actually. It's a really, <laughs> having written both, I, I, I can't, I can't. I'm, I'm very rare that I'm asking I really have no answer to. But um, I will say that I met Sean Connery once, and I said almost nothing. I was so tongue-tied and so shocked to meet my absolute hero uh, that I actually got quite drunk. It was over lunch, and, and, <laughs> and I think I asked him, do you like acting? That was about as far as my, <laughs> my conversation went. So. Did he say no? I can't remember. I can really answer. imagine Sean Connery saying no. Uh, thank true story you very much. Uh, who are we going to next? Yes. Yeah. First of all, thanks very much for being a very quick speaker because you've managed to cram in such a lot of information. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm going to be really, really disappointed if the next Bond is... Um, nothing other than a good-looking man. <laughs> What's your thought on that? Um, well, uh, to be fair to Barbara Broccoli, she's always said that she could never cast a woman as Bond, and I think it would be a huge mistake to do that because Bond is, for better or for worse, everything that we sort of expect from 50s and 60s masculinity. And, and, uh, and what I always say is, if you want to go for a female Bond, look up the novels by Peter O'Donnell, uh, the Modesty Blaze books. Uh, which were the equivalent of the Bond novels written in the sort of 60s and 70s uh, and were very much also a part of my childhood, and I love them. And Modesty is... Have you read Modesty of Lays? Modesty is one of my favourite things of all time. Oh, well, time. there you are. They made the worst film ever. It's a very sad thing yeah. that whereas, you know, with, with Bond, they lucked out and cast Sean Connery, not incidentally David Niven, who was Ian Fleming's first choice. Uh, and can you imagine how that might have turned out? They got exactly the right Bond, and they got Ken Adams to do the sets, and they got John Barry to do the music. So they just created this extraordinary franchise. Unfortunately, although Monica Vitti is pretty good as Modesty Blaze, and Terence Stamp plays Willie Garvin, her sidekick, the director, Joseph Losey, decided to do a sort of a 60s psychedelic, nonsensical sort of crazy thing. Audiences hated it. It killed the entire franchise dead. But that's really what, if they're going to do a female Bond, they should just do Modesty Blaze. I'd love to see a modern adaptation of Modesty Blaze. There's been a talk that Quentin Tarantino is a Modesty Blaze fan, that. And, that, yeah. and that in Pulp Fiction, John Travolta in the toilet is reading Modesty Blaze. So there is a possibility. In fact, Quentin Tarantino made a Modesty Blaze film uh, because he had to do it to hang on to the rights. But he made it for very little money very quickly, and it's never been shown. Mm. I'd love to see it. Oh, God, yeah. Uh, who are we going to next? Um, this gentleman here, just... A mic down the front. the front, thank you. 
Hi, do you think you have a different experience to a lot of authors when you meet your audience because you have adult readers who read your crime books, you have young adults who read Alex Ryder, and you have people who grew up with you and have read both. So do you think you get a better experience than some authors because of that? I can't compare my experience with other authors, but I can say that one of the pleasures of, of my career has been the fact that I've done so many different things. I've, I've, I've had it said to me that actually it's been my undoing, but that authors should be more easily pigeonholed. And if I had written my 37th, 38th Alex Ryder book by now, I'd be known for what I'm going to do, whereas, in fact, every book I publish is different. I mean, you know, this year, thanks to COVID, I've actually had three books published. They were sort of, you know, like, like buses. They all piled up on each other, one after another. Uh, and those three books were a Bond novel, so a continuation novel, um, a Diamond Brothers book called Where Seagulls Dare, uh, which is, they're all film pastiches, um, uh, which I recommend. In today's day. I'm very happy with that book. It's quite a fun book about, about Brexit, amongst other things. Um, and, um, uh, uh, but still a children's adventure. And then, of course, a third, a fourth Hawthorne novel was my third book of this year. And to me, that's the whole love of writing. It's, the, it's being able to do different things. Um, you know, and, and then again, you, you mentioned the television work and, and the other things, and Alex Ryder, so I wouldn't have it any other way. To me, I love variety, I love challenge, I like trying to do things. But my talks often when I'm here, uh, in front of an audience, I do notice, you know, that's the Foyles War part of the audience, and there's some kids who obviously want to talk about Alex Ryder. And if anybody wants to talk about anything, about, you know, my books or my life, my unhappy marriage, you're very welcome to, to just, um, you know, just, just ask anything. And, I, and, and I, 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 although we're under the Bond umbrella, I think that's, that's allowed. <laughs> Um, another question uh, from uh, folks online. This is from Elizabeth, who wonders if you've ever thought of Putin as a model for a villain. And, and here we have uh, Russia as the villains. Well, funnily enough, I mean, the, with a mind to kill, and thank you, Elizabeth, for the question. Um, Putinism is, begins where with a mind to kill sort of ends. I mean, this is the Russia of Khrushchev and the sense that, um, that things are going wrong, that it is no longer as big a power as it should be, and that, and that, you know, particularly because of the Cuban Missile Crisis and because of relationships with China, Russia is no longer a superpower and communism is under threat. And that's where Putin begins. I mean, Putin is basically KGB from the time of this book, um, and, and that's his influences. But as to the question of whether I would actually put Putin into a book or write about him? The answer is definitely not, because I think that the, the role I have as a writer and what my books do is, is to provide escapism. I mean, I'm not interested in really writing about the real world particularly. I mean, the books are informed by the real world. I've already said that Alex Ryder was inspired by the Iraq war, but it wasn't a book in which Saddam Hussein appeared as a character. Uh, I have written a play in which Saddam Hussein um, did appear as a character, and that didn't go too well, divided the critics exactly 50-50. Half of them hated it, and half of them loathed it. Um, but um, <laughs> uh, uh, the... the um, <laughs> I think my role as a writer, and I've said this often, you know, you may have noticed I've, I've, I've had a bit of press recently about sort of woke issues and, and other such things, and I try to back away from doing that. On the one hand, I'm happy to be in the papers to talk about the books and to publicize the books, but, I, but, but, but my role is to entertain, and I've always known that. That's, that's, you know, I'm not as good a writer as my hero writers, <laughs> Fleming or, or Conan Doyle, for that matter, or many, many modern writers whom I, whose work I love. But at the same time, I'm doing okay for kids and for sort of, you know, adults who like to be kids, in a way, reading my books. <laughs> Don't forget that Fleming always thought of his own books, his own Bond novels, mm. as sort of, he called them kiss, kiss, bang, mm. bang, children's fantasies. Um, yeah. And, you know, if, he's, if that's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. <laughs> Absolutely. And I would say uh, more than doing more than OK. Um, so we have more questions. Thing. Yes. Yes, my question is about Foyle's War, actually. Um, so I read somewhere that at one point the series was cancelled, so you had to sort of rush to the end of the war, and then it was picked up again. And so you went after the war. And I was just wondering, I read that you had to throw out some script ideas for what you would have done if you'd been going more deliberately. So what is your big regret from those missing episodes or series? Or To be honest with you, I can't remember. I mean, basically, I missed a whole year. 1944, my war lasted only four years with sort of one year of peace and neutrality, uh, with the Nazis just sitting quietly at home and nobody doing anything, <laughs> uh, which is sort of weird. I think the one episode I most miss is the one in which Foyle went to America. 
Um, you may recall that at one of the end of the episodes, in fact, I'm the, I do like to do my little Hitchcock appearances. I'm the guy who, in, the, in the purser's costume checking his ticket as he gets on the transatlantic boat to go to America, and he's going to chase a crooked senator, played by Henry Goodman in the original episode called 50 Ships, uh, and bring him down. That was sort of the, the, the idea. And I've always wanted to know what happened to Foyle in America, because we know only when he came back again that, that um, the senator has died. We don't know how, but Foyle comes back having sort of righted the wrongs. And I've always been tempted to write that. I can't, we did at one stage try to set it up as TV, but first of all, there is no longer a very large appetite, it seems, amongst television companies for period detectives, um, certainly not at the moment. Secondly, there's a cost issue. You can't make one 70-minute, 90-minute film because you need to make three one and a half hours to spread the cost of all your period vehicles and costumes, etc. Thirdly, I don't think Michael Kitchen would be game anymore. He's retired happily to Dorset. Uh, so, so it's just not gonna happen. But that's, that's, that's the one story that I think I most miss. But there were loads of things happening in 1944. I'd begun the research and just, you know, we were glad, you know, it was a public vote that got us back. Somebody new came in as the head of ITV. The first thing they do is cancel some of the old shows. And it was people writing in and saying, you know, this is wrong, that did it for us. So that, that was a very, that was a real, you know, happy moment in my career. Mm. And I think time for one more question. Yes. Oh, hi, thank you very much. I come from China and uh, I have to say your books are also very popular in China, especially The, uh, the House of Sook and the maybe Mike Pymotter, such things. And I have a question. Uh, have you find any similarity when you write Sherlock Holmes and James Bond? Do you think there are any similarity between these two characters? Wow, what a fabulous last question, and it, it'll take me about 15 minutes to answer, so <laughs> we'll be here a little longer. Um, there are similarities. I mean, let's face it, first, I'm, I'm delighted my books are, are, are in China, and I'm also glad I didn't say anything bad about China in the course of his talk, as I recall, which is <laughs> quite handy. Um, I guess there are similarities, and, and there, I'll, I'll give you an obvious one, and I'll give you one which is more relevant and personal to me. The obvious one is that these are iconic figures. You know, Conan Doyle created the modern detective story as we understand it. Sherlock Holmes, yes, there was Dupin, who is a character created by Poe, but he's not really a detective. If you're, if you're looking for the sort of the three-act mystery, the crime, the, the solution, the crime, the investigation, the solution, and also the idea of a detective with a sidekick, Agatha Christie borrowed heavily from Conan Doyle, you know, the whole Poirot Jap. Uh, Poirot, yeah, well, Poirot Jap is Lestrade, and Poirot Watson, I'm getting confused. Poirot and Hastings yeah, is and Sherlock, uh, Sherlock Holmes yeah. and Watson. So they're iconic figures, and they have huge followings amongst people who are passionate about them. You know, there is a Sherlock, there's a Sherlock Society, I think, in England, and a home society in America. There's a Baker Street Irregular somewhere. There are people who get dress up every year and go to the Reckenbach Falls and throw each other off. No, I made that bit up. <laughs> uh, but, um, but, but I have been with them to the Reichenbach Falls, and, and you have to respect that. I, I absolutely love people who have this deep, felt love for literature. And as a, as a continuation novelist, it always reminds me to, to tread carefully, to, 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 to not tear the envelope. Bond, uh, Sherlock Holmes, no women. There was only Irene Adler, etc. You obey the rules. The second more personal thing, and I'll finish on this note, is what's fascinating is, is that neither author very much respected their characters. Doyle creates the greatest detective in history, and throws him off the Reichenbach Falls to kill him because he thinks it's beneath him. But he wants to write books like Micah Clark and The White Company. Hands up who's read those. Those are the books that I have. Doyle wanted us to read those books. Fleming also thought very poorly of Bond and said a lot of bad things about him. And I'm writing about that a lot. If you read my, At uh, my Atticus Punt novels, they're all about a writer called Alan Conway who hates his characters. And that's what I've learned from both Sherlock Holmes and from Bond. Mm. And I've managed to do and finish that. Look at that on 007. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Tim. Thank you. It was lovely. Thank you. Thank you.